Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator, Claudio Rosette. Welcome everyone to the Kuklinski Museum discussion series and today's panel on Poland, the US, and NATO, confronting the Russian threat. I just want to say I worked in Russia back in the mid-90s, and at the time there was a lot of discussion about NATO that sort of was with our NATO, what you know, do we need NATO? What's NATO now supposed to be? It all seemed rather academic. Today it does not seem academic at all. These are real serious questions. There is a real serious threat again. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists who will each make a brief opening statement, then we'll move to a discussion among the panelists, and toward the end, we will open up the floor to questions from the audience, which we warmly welcome. Uh, our first panelist will be Minister Anna Maria Anders. She's a Polish senator and a minister in the Polish government, where she is plenipotentiary for international dialogue. Uh, she, she also represents Poland and the Women in Parliament's Global Forum, a global network of female parliamentarians that supports greater participation of women in politics. Minister Anders is the daughter of General Władysław Anders, the legendary World War II commander of the Polish forces at the Battle of Monte Cassino, and well-known singer and actress Irena Renata Anders. She was born in London. In 1986, she married a United States Army Colonel, Robert Alexander Costa, and their son is an officer in the U.S. Army. Um, our second speaker will be Brigadier General Tom Cosentino. Following an Army career <laughs> that included numerous operational and strategic assignments over a 30-year span, uh, General Constantino now serves as the Chief Operating Officer of a nonprofit. Business Executives for National Security, or BENZ. Tom joined BENZ in 2015 following his last military assignment, where he served as the 28th Commandant of the National War College, the premier institution for the education of strategic leaders for the United States military, other parts of the US government, and 29 allied nations. Prior to assuming command of the National War College, he served as Deputy Director for Political and Military Affairs, providing advice to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense. He also served previously as the Deputy Commanding General for Regional Support, NATO Training Mission Afghanistan, and Chief of Strategy, Plans, and Assessment for the, National, for the Multinational Security Transition Command in Iraq. Um, our third speaker will be Dr. John Lenchowski. Dr. Lenchowski is founder and president of the Institute of World Politics, an independent graduate school of national security and international affairs in Washington. From 1981 to 83, he served in the State Department in the Bureau of European Affairs and a special advisor to Undersecretary for, Politi for Political Affairs Lawrence Eagleburger. From 1983 to 87, he was director of European and Soviet Affairs at the National Security Council a critical period, I must say. In that capacity, he was principal Soviet affairs advisor to President Reagan. He's been associated with a number of academic and research institutions in the Washington area, including Georgetown University, the American Enterprise Institute, the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and a number of others. He is the author of many published works, including Soviet Perceptions of U.S. Foreign Policy, uh, Soviet Sources of Soviet Perestroika. You can find more details on all these splendid speakers in your program. Uh, but now we're going to open the floor to their remarks, starting, please, with Minister Anders. Hello, everybody. Um, incredible week. We've been talking about NATO, I think, all week. Uh, 70th anniversary of NATO, and uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated 20 years uh, since Poland joined NATO. Um, it is now arguably the largest and most successful alliance in history. Uh, the proof, I guess, is there has been no war in Europe for the last 70 years. But uh, we have to move forward. We can't gloat over the past. What are the things that we have to concentrate on? We have to adapt to new threats. There has to be solidarity between members. We need a very strong EU-US link, and we must engage broader audiences. By that, I mean that politicians should educate their uh, people about uh, their constituents about NATO and the advantages of NATO and what they're doing. 
Um, there still doesn't seem to be an over, overall defense program for Europe in the next five years. What are the major issues that NATO faces today? Well, number one is Russia. This is what our conference is all about. Um, let me think, let me give you a think. Uh, did we ever imagine 10 years ago that Russia would be our prime focus today? Uh, it seems to me wherever we go, uh, there's a threat of Russia. Um, Poland was aware of that threat, I think, before the rest of uh, the world. Uh, the rest of the world chose to ignore it to a certain point until Crimea. Uh, now, we, I think we're all very much on board, and we really do have come, have come a long way. Uh, the other uh, danger we face is energy independence as we squabble over the Baltic pipe and Nord Stream 2, uh, cybersecurity, and last but not least, I think it's the political instability in Europe. Um, obviously Brexit, uh, the imminent departure of Angela Merkel, and generally uh, the confusion that exists in Europe today, which makes me think sometimes that there's less of a problem between the transatlantic alliance than the fact that Europe somehow, the countries in Europe cannot work together. Um, Russia, it seems to be involved anywhere, everywhere, and it sometimes feels like they're almost um, tempting NATO, um, teasing NATO to see how they would respond. We had the standoff on the Black Sea. We still have three Ukrainian soldiers uh, in jail, and that doesn't seem to be going anywhere at the moment. Um, the collapse of the INF Treaty is something that we have to consider very seriously. Uh, Russia is in violation of the treaty. Let me remind everybody, there are no U.S. missiles in Europe. There are only potentially Russian missiles. We see Russia in Syria, Russian troops coming to Venezuela, and everywhere they are taking advantage of the chaos to step in. The Nord Stream 2, Germany and Russia are supported by several European countries are at loggerheads with the United States that wants to uh, impose sanctions. Sanctions against Iran, that brings in China, Hawaii, and the 5G program. Um, the United States is against it. Italy has recently decided to go ahead with the 5G. Going forward, NATO is definitely alive and well. We saw the bipartisan support uh, in Congress at the joint session with Jens Stoltenberg. Uh, but we have to maintain unity for future generations. Um, many members have come forward to contribute more spending, but there are still only five that are contributing the necessary required 2%, which includes Poland. Um, as we encourage more countries to become members of NATO, let us remember that it's only by standing together that we can be sure, be sure to be a deterrent to foreign aggression. Uh, NATO is there as a deterrent, not as a catalyst, and definitely not somebody who is going to provoke a war. I am proud to say that Poland is fully committed to the cause, and I am really proud to represent Poland at this meeting today and around the world today. Thank you. Claudia, uh, Minister, Doctor. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be with you uh, today on the panel. Uh, I'm really happy to see that this is a very Catholic group. I knew that because the only people sitting in the front, front row were under <laughs> duress because they came late. So, 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 so don't worry, no baskets will be coming around at, at this event. Uh, and uh, just just to be clear, who's the GRU agent in the room? It's it's Cosentino with a C, not a K. And finally, I would say that if uh, my remarks today are, are mundane, uh, please blame John Lynchowski. He was my uh, professor in grad school, and he had an opportunity to to nip my career in the bud, and he he missed it. Um, that, <laughs> Thank you for uh, coming today. I think it's an important topic. And uh, again, thanks to uh, uh, the Kokinski Museum, uh, General Kokinski, uh, a hero and a patriot, uh, and a reminder to us all about the importance of uh, dedication and love of country. 
Um, I, I just have a couple of remarks since we, we have a few minutes to start. And it's really about what is NATO and maybe how NATO has kind of drifted a little bit from its intent. Uh, I was honored to be a, a general officer in NATO training mission Afghanistan. And I can tell you that uh, the uh, soldiers and Marines of, of uh, NATO forces, all of them that participated, included, including Poland, were only the most high quality people and they were great allies. And we worked together and it's a testament to the uh, military command and the alliance and the, nature, uh, the nations who participated that uh, w they've stuck with us through those missions in Afghanistan. But it does call into question why we had NATO in the first place. And I would just offer on the 70th anniversary of NATO, it's good to remember that NATO was not a partnership between the European Union and the United States. NATO was a alliance of sovereign states with individual sovereign national interest that overlapped because we had a common threat, the Soviet Union. And that common threat then caused us to bring forward that common national interest uh, in a collective defense organization. Somewhere around 1991, um, uh, NATO became the military structure for the New World Order. And when that happened, uh, I think we forgot a little bit about why we had this organization. Um, and it became very easy for nation states, especially smaller ones, who had, had contributed and stood up and been part of NATO during the Cold War to, to look at this and say, well, hey, we did our part. The, the issue's over. Uh, and if this is going to be the United States and eventually this amorphous e EU alliance and uh, to do collective security and manage the global economy, we'll let them pay for it. And, and it's understandable. The th the, uh, the, the actions that nation states take are understandable. And, but now we're in a different place. Um, I think we've realized again, at least I hope that uh, the people in this room have realized, is that the threat never went away. It, it uh, like a bear, it hibernated for a little while and, and it's back. And I think it's a good time on the 70th anniversary of NATO to, to relook at its core principles and, and that idea of national sovereignty, nation states who have common interests and who, who work together uh, to uh, defend uh, and deter uh, aggression and if necessary, defeat it. And, and as a result of that, I think it will cause us to look at who's investing in their defense and why they're doing it and to make a more cogent argument on why this, uh, this collective defense is very critical in the 21st century. And it also will, uh, there was a, a big move uh, for uh, specialization and, and niche capabilities. And, and I don't actually argue that some nations are very good at particular capabilities. The Estonians, after being viciously uh, attacked and cyber raped by the, the Russians, have become extremely good at cyber defense. And they have a lot to offer to the, to the alliance. The Czechs have always been fantastic in um, their, uh, their technology reference the potential for a weapon of mass destruction and, and, uh, and clean it up. And the Poles, uh, since they've joined NATO, have maintained a robust ground combat capability because they'll be the front line if there's ever a need to fight. So there is a place for specialization, but there's also a, uh, an important place for interoperability and looking at this alliance for what it is. It's nation states investing together to be interoperable to defeat a threat. Um, and I, I guess we can thank the threat for reminding of us of, about that. Uh, because they sure 
still think it's 1985, uh, even if we haven't. Uh, so today I would, uh, I would just offer as, as my opening remarks that uh, I think Dr. Lancheski will tell you a little bit about that common threat, but to think about why the nation states participate in NATO, and maybe the argument when we, when we talk to them about pulling their load is we have to reinforce that this is not just about managing uh, the global economy. It's, 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 uh, it's not about collectively dealing with uh, even terrorism or climate change or uh, migration or any of the myriad uh, uh, threats to the global commons. It's about defending your national sovereignty about a threat that could very well be existential if we don't match their investment in technology. I would take the United States and our NATO partners any day over the Russians. That doesn't mean that, um, that they are not a significant threat to the alliance. And uh, look forward to having a discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, General. Dr. Lenchowski. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. I, I would like to thank the White House Writers Group, the Kuklinski Museum, uh, the Polish National Foundation, and all others who've been responsible for putting this series together. I think it's a wonderful contribution. Um, I would like to, um, to begin by reflecting on the fact that uh, statesmanship uh, and that, that our national leaders have a, a really grave responsibility, and that is to keep people aware of the fragility of civilization. Uh, we've gone through this the last century where so many things went so dreadfully wrong, where you had the rise of, of Nazism, fascism, uh, communism, uh, the metastasis of, uh, of, of, of communism around the world, uh, a, a phenomenon that killed more people, more of their, where communist regimes killed more of their own people than were killed by all of the wars of the 20th century. And um, uh, unfortunately, we forget things. And in America, Americans are a very ahistorical people. We don't understand history nearly as well as, as Europeans do. Uh, but it seems as though the Europeans seem to be forgetting history very much in the same way we Americans do. And, uh, and one, of the pro one of the other problems that is associated with this lack of memory uh, and, and failure to remember history is, uh, is the fact that there's a lot of utopianism in international diplomacy. There are lots of people who, who especially who are special, specialists in the field of international relations. Some who think, well, we just need a few better international law, uh, a little more, a few more treaties, a little bit more dialogue and and uh, and mutual understanding, and we'll all live in peace together. Then there are some who think we can go and democratize other countries uh, at uh, the drop of a hat. There, there are others uh, who think that if we just get out of their face, they will stop hating us. And then there are some people who think, that the so-called realists, who think that we can uh, have a policy according to the vital national interest that uh, only pays attention to realpolitik and it doesn't have things like moral and uh, humanitarian considerations interfering. Uh, and in the midst of all this utopianism, uh, there are other impediments to seeing foreign realities correctly, uh, including disinformation, uh, active measures, covert political influence operations, and propaganda. And right now, we are suffering from an, a, a combination of all of these things because we are, are not really facing up to the fact that we in the West are, are really engaged in three cold wars, but we don't really realize what they all are. Uh, the, the Chinese 
have, which, which are considered to be the principal existential threat to the United States and the West, including Europe. Uh, but Europe has to wake up to this possibility. Um, <clears throat> Have, uh, have been conducting a Cold War against the United States for a number of years. Um, they have uh, just, they have somewhere around 50,000 intelligence collectors in the United States today. God knows how many in Europe. Um, they have uh, thousands of, of, of newspapers, radio stations, TV stations. They have a massive active measures operation uh, of, of covert influence uh, operations. Uh, Xi Jinping just added 40,000 people to the United Front Work Department that runs uh, Chinese active measures. Um, and of course, we all know about Russian active measures. We know about their interference in our elections. They were engaged for 20 years in, uh, uh, in, in subversion in Ukraine before they finally sent in the little green men uh, to, to take over uh, Crimea. Uh, the, the Russians, of course, want to reestablish uh, their, their empire over the previous uh, um, uh, Soviet political space. Uh, they would like to cast the shadow over all of East and Central Europe. And then they would like to have hegemony over all of Europe, uh, which is, has been their longstanding ambition whether they are able to do this, given the fact that uh, they are committing demographic suicide and that their economy is, is decreasingly variegated and, and increasingly dependent upon oil and gas and just a limited number of natural resources, I don't know. Uh, I happen to think Russia can be deterred, but one has to have a stout military policy in the West and there, and, and, uh, uh, the, the, I think that, all, that, 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 uh, that China can be deterred as well and contained, although that's going to be a much bigger challenge, I think, than dealing with Russia. Of course, the third Cold War we're in is with radical Islamism. And I think that it is potentially an existential threat to Europe, particularly if ever more uh, Islamist separatist enclaves run by Sharia law uh, begin to prevail in ever more countries uh, that are members of the NATO alliance. Um, I, th I don't know that we face the same grave threat in the United States, but Sharia supremacism uh, is, is a radical ideology which is supercharging the, 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 the Islamist, uh, or, or let's say the Islamic uh, practices of Hijra and Dawa uh, and uh, and rather than, uh, and, and so the radical Islamists, rather than wanting to see a, a, uh, a more gradual Islamization of the places where, to which they immigrate, such as Indonesia, they, they want to supercharge this and, and have it uh, go extremely fast. I think it is a threat to, to, to Western values. And this ultimately gets back to the question of whether we have a sufficiently uh, whether we understand history, the, the fragility of civilization, and the reasons why NATO exists, which is not simply to deter a single threat, but to try to maintain uh, the, the, the free uh, uh, democratic republican character of its membership, which is why we have these different provisions, political provisions, which are prerequisites for entry into NATO. I believe there ought to be a, 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 um, uh, an alliance of Western civilization, and we can include some of our other friends elsewhere in the world uh, that, that are effectively our allies. But we have to realize that, that uh, there are certain values and principles that, that deserve to be protected and cannot be abandoned, and eternal vigilance is the price of maintaining those things. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, maybe we could start with a question about uh, the essence of sort of the questions about NATO here. Um, could I ask each of you to just talk briefly about why is this existentially important to the United States? I, I want to do the flip side and ask about the NATO members, but why does it matter to America? Uh, well, I think um, 
as regards Poland, uh, really I would say that you know, Poland right now is uh, the United States' uh, strongest ally. Um, and um, the United States is at odds a little bit with the European Union, with a lot of the other European countries. And um, Poland has really uh, stood up to, you know, to, to, to what it's asked to. Uh, we have housing, uh, I say housing, we have a rotational force of over 4,000 know, soldiers, NATO soldiers. Uh, we're looking uh, possibly to have um, a permanent base, possibly, or if not a permanent base, some, some you know, increase in troops. Um, and I think that it's safe to say that the United States needs to have a solid partner in, in Europe. And I would say that Poland uh, definitely provides that right now. Thank you. Well, so I'm probably uh, uh, Dr. Lenchowski's, you know, realist in the room, but uh, but I I think that the history of uh, of uh, conflict is is uh, nation states are at some point are going to balance their bandwagon, and um, we do. I agree with the doctor on the three uh, threats that he raised to our civilization, but also to to our nation, and um, it's a lot easier to rally the morale of peoples if they are like-minded uh, peoples, if they, if they have democratic principles. And that's really the, the, the founding core principle of NATO, uh, like-minded principles uh, coming together. And, and uh, in this case, I, I think the fact that uh, if we don't want uh, partners to drift, uh, and come under the influence of, of our opponents, yeah. then um, uh, embracing and leading alliance is still important to the United States. I'm gonna alter the question a little bit for Dr. Lentowski, and that is, at what moment, with an eye to why this might matter to the United States, at what moment did Russia reemerge as a serious threat? Did it, was it ever, I mean, you mentioned the threat never really went away. When did it turn into something that is actually dangerous to us directly again? Um, I, I believe that uh, already in 1992, Russian national security doctrine contained such provisions as uh, maintaining the, uh, the right to protect R Russian speakers yeah. Uh, <clears throat> wherever they may live uh, if their rights are being violated by their host country. Uh, and the, the, even the very formulation of this doctrine was something contrary to international law, I should add. Uh, I think that the people in the power ministries in Russia were the ones who, who were, were basically the heirs of the KGB and the GRU. Uh, are, were the ones who formulated this. But I think Boris Yeltsin was uh, realistic and enlightened enough to say, well, if the Ukrainians want to be part of Russia, they can certainly be. And if they don't want to be, why should we be forcing them to be part of this whole deal? And of course, they acceded to the, uh, to the independence of Ukraine after the referendum in that country. Um, but. I think that it was when Putin came into power and when Putin uh, began to recognize that he had a legitimacy problem and that he had to restore R Russian national greatness. Uh, he had to uh, stanch the potential uh, further breaking apart of the Russian empire by launching the second Chechen war. Uh, and of course there is very serious evidence uh, collected by independent Russian journalists of the FSB planting bombs in, in, uh, uh, in Russian apartment buildings and blaming it on the Chechens. Uh, and of course, every journalist uh, in Russia that was following this story is now dead. Uh, and, and so I think that uh, because of the corruption of the elections uh, that, uh, that Putin uh, which, which he won, uh, presented him with a, a, a serious illegitimacy problem. And I think that he has been working on trying to solve that 
through, uh, not through any political, philosophical, democratic means or anything like that, but basically through restoration of Russian national greatness and the restoration of empire. Thank you. General Constantino, could I ask you to give us an idea of how dangerous is Russia today? I mean, what are the, just in brief, the dimensions and the extent of the threat? How serious is it? Well, and let me uh, go off of something that the doctor said in his opening remarks about, you know, the Russian challenges with demographics and, uh, and weakness in their economy. I'd remind everybody that uh, a focused nation, the Germans in 1943, beleaguered on all sides, were putting all their effort into high technology and they came very close. If we had lost the race to, to an A-bomb yeah. to the Germans, I promise you they would have used it in, in war and we could have very easily lost that war. The lesson of that is that even when you have the predominance of, of national power, economic, I would argue moral and social. Um, if the, the, your opponent is focused their energy and their resources on leap ahead technologies and they have the will to seize the opportunity, especially if they're in duress, to try to change the, the name of the game, that's a very, that's not a cornered uh, weak opponent, that's a very dangerous opponent. And the Russians are putting their money uh, where it counts. It's uh, uh, hypersonic weapons, cyber, uh, ad advanced capabilities. They are a robust threat. Um, and oh, by the way, they're not afraid to proliferate some of that to other opponents to try to, uh, you know, kind of spread the wealth and distract us. Uh, and, and make us have to, to compete on multiple fronts. Talking about things like anti-missile defense systems to Turkey or to sales, Syria, sales to Iran. To Syria, to, to uh, why, why are there Russian troops uh, landing in Venezuela? I mean, they're, uh, they, they uh, while they have a lot of, uh, they have severe demographic and economic challenges exacerbated by their system and their unwillingness to kind of join a, a, a global community, they are not, they should not be underestimated, uh, especially in their willingness to in, invest in, in weapons of war. Thank you. Minister Anders, Poland lives on the front lines of this for a long time. Yeah. So could I ask you, just thinking afield, why are Russian troops landing in Venezuela right now? Is this of concern, for instance, to Poland? Um, I think it's a concern for me. Um, I, I think the, the concern with Russia is the fact that, as I said in my opening statement, it seems to take advantage of confusion everywhere. Um, you know, Venezuela is just the latest example. You know, they're in, in Syria. Um, they um, take advantage of it. And I think, um, as I also said, I think 10 years ago, we didn't realize quite what a threat uh, Russia was. I think Russia took advantage of uh, the uh, so-called Arab Spring at the time, uh, and um, they thought, well, if we cannot agree, if the rest of the world cannot agree on a certain, uh, certain position, uh, they step in. Um, I see Venezuela uh, definitely as a, as a problem because I, you know, they are supporting Maduro. The people are suffering. We have sort of a connection there with Cuba. <laughs> And Venezuela is very much closer to the United States than, than Europe is. So problem with, you know, when you look at NATO, is how, how we're looking at European defense. And, and really, this is not a subject that is part of the sort of the NATO subject or the NATO interest. But I really think that you have to stretch beyond that. I mean, uh, NATO has to be, get involved in, uh, I guess, or the United States, the world has to get involved in, in order to prevent something awful happening there too. Um, on that score, could I ask you all about the, the basic structure of NATO and whoever wants to pick up on this. Is America profoundly different from the other members? Is it basically the linchpin in effect is NATO sort of in some ways a front for the United States? And uh, or is, in that context, what I want to ask you further is 
what could the NATO members, the smaller members or members like the most threatened members such as Poland, do to ensure that Americans would be willing to die for their defense, would actually uphold Article 5? I think show commitment by, by paying the, uh, the required 2%. You know, it's it, it really, you know, it's very difficult as, and I, and I'm a, an American as well as a Polish citizen, you know, and, and as an American, I think, you know, it's, it just doesn't seem to be fair that the United States is really, and I have a son in the, uh, in the US Army. Uh, so I'm thinking, why should, uh, you know, US military die for a country that is not going to pr uh, pay its fair share? Um, so, you know, I'm actually surprised what I heard this week, you know, people have been criticizing uh, President Trump for going on and on and on about this required 2%, but it has made a difference, and from what I heard, I can't remember exact figures, but there has been considerably more uh, money spent, and I'm hoping that people are going to cough up. I think we call it skin in the game, but um, could I ask Dr. Lenchowski, how do what is it that European countries could do along with actually paying the, spending the 2% on defense that they've pledged? Are there other things that America should be asking, that their own leaders should be asking of their people? Uh, what is it that North Macedonia should be doing for us? Or for that matter, is there something else we should be asking of Poland? I believe that um, there are many non-military instruments of national power that are much more affordable than uh, a full spectrum military force that every NATO country can contribute to. Uh, first of all, a, an enormous amount can be done in the field of intelligence. Uh, there, are, there are special uh, capabilities uh, and there's special knowledge that many different uh, NATO countries have uh, particularly, I mean, when, when, when I ask some of my, I can't be a, a, uh, an expert, a serious expert on Russia anymore. I have another job to do today. But when I ask some of my friends who are serious experts on Russia, where is the best information and analysis about Russia coming from? And they, without blinking, they say Poland. And, uh, and so if there are, so, and, and Poland need not be the only one uh, with its, uh, uh, you know, antennae uh, pointed in that direction. Uh, there are other countries can pay attention to these things as well. And, and then there is information policy. Um, I think it's extremely important for these countries to help inform the world, inform the NATO alliance, inform the United States, and inform the American people now, you know, pu public diplomacy is one of the most neglected elements of, 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 our, of our national power. We shut down the U.S. Information Agency in 1999. We have folded only a, a shadow of its former capabilities into the Department of State. The Department of State doesn't care about it. It doesn't reward excellence in public diplomacy or the various forms of strategic influence. Uh, there are... Uh, there are, you know, countering foreign propaganda and disinformation. Some of the countries in East Central Europe and Poland do some excellent analysis of, of, of Russian propaganda, uh, R Russian uh, disinformation and active measures. And, uh, you know, we, we stopped paying attention to these things after the end of the Reagan administration. I was in the Soviet Active Measures Working Group, and it lasted until the end of the Reagan administration, and then it pretty much was shut down. And when the Ukrainians started complaining in 1994 about Russian active measures against them, in 1994, uh, the, uh, the, nobody in Washington noticed. Nobody had noticed. Well, maybe there might have been some people in East Central Europe who noticed, and, and maybe, maybe there were others in elsewhere in, in, in Europe who might have noticed. Thank you. General, would you like to comment on that or perhaps further expand on how we address these, this problem with Brussels of sort of paying attention to the sovereign states when there's the centralized bureaucracy there? Well, when you talk 
Brussels. I don't think Brussels. I, I think okay. Mons and I think NATO headquarters. Okay. Uh, again, we've had this discussion at panels before. I don't really, I'm American. I don't really care about the European Union. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I hope they buy American. And uh, we've got lots of natural gas in, uh, it, you know, that, that we can send to them. Uh, but what they do is kind of their business. That's the yeah. business of Europeans. Um, so I think our, uh, I do think, you know, embracing um, the uh, uh, talents and, and skills and uh, uh, that the, the individual states of, of NATO have to support the alliance are important. I also think that there's um, is sometimes there's engagement that uh, a uh, NATO member, not the United States, might be able to, to, uh, um, uh, to lead out of area. Yeah. that, that uh, support the whole, uh, it's a little bit easier for, for some countries to absorb it if say it's coming from Poland or, or Italy or some, someone else. Uh, so I think there is a value there too in formal diplomacy as well as, as um, uh, public diplomacy. Um, I think it's gonna be a little bit easier if we recognize that we're not about going into their countries and telling them how to run every aspect of their life. We're about, hey, let's pitch together against this, these common uh, threats and challenges. Um, so personally, um, I, I don't put a lot of this on the, I, I actually have a lot of sympathy for the, the members of NATO. Um, we, to some degree, are responsible for having to try to morph this organization into something it wasn't designed to be. And we're kind of back to the future in a world with a uh, 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 peer challenger in Asia, um, a, if not necessarily a peer, at least a peer in the most dangerous aspects in Russia. And then this, this global uh, uh, network of, of uh, radicalism that's connected to cartels and every other criminal activity out there. So I, I, I think Let's get back to, to get back to basics here. And I think that when we approach them like that, I think we can convince rather than compel our, our allies to, to pitch in. And uh, uh, you know, and, and there's always consequences to it if they don't. Um, Claudia, I just wanted to add one other thing. During right now with uh, Chinese and Russian uh, mm -hmm. cyber espionage. Uh, the massive Chinese espionage presence in the United States. Uh, I, uh, I think that we have a technology security problem of gargantuan proportions. And uh, during the Cold War, we had a, group, uh, a, a, a multinational uh, group of, of allies called COCOM, the, the Coordinating Committee on Multilateral Export Controls, which worked together to ensure that one of the countries within this group would not try to undercut the others by selling its products to the Soviet Union. Yeah. And today we have to restore that kind of a structure. It has to be alliance-wide. It has to include countries like Japan, uh, South Korea, and others, uh, w which are also developing some of these technologies. This is. Today, the Chinese are, are putting into their military systems technologies, and the Russians too, technologies that are, may be ahead of ours in certain respects. For example, in space technology. Uh, they, 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 the Chinese are winning the race today in the military, militarization of space. And uh, it is not an accident that the US Navy has restored education in celestial navigation in anticipation of the day that the Chinese take out our GPS system. Hey, can I, can yeah, I just sure. chime in on one thing? I agree with Dr. Lenchowski on that. And where I, where I would go further, when you start really bringing this down to brass tacks for, for countries whose economies are at stake, I think we need to be very clear to them on what's important and what's not important. Mm -hmm. um, how a, a, a country in Europe does business in general with China. Uh, I don't think every deal they do with China should drive us into, you know, that, that they're part of the Belt and Road and they're gonna be colonized. On the other hand, 
if they embrace Chinese 5G, yeah. which, which could have a, a, a fundamentally uh, disruptive effect on uh, our security and the ability of NATO to operate, that's where we have to kind of call it as it is. So don't freak out every time Poland or Hungary or the Italians or whatever cut a trade deal with China and beat us out because they, gotta, they have their own economies to worry about. Focus on the things that are absolutely critical and those high-tech areas that we need to make sure that they know that, that we won't tolerate and there'd be a, a consequence if they, if they do it. Thank which you. Is, is actually exclusion from, uh, from, uh, from integrated decision making. So let me say, speak now as, as somebody who does care about the Europeans because I represent Poland. Um, I think you, you have to understand the concept of European Union. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not so easy to say, well, you know, let's not bother with Italy because, you know, Spain is not doing it or France is not doing it. This is the whole, this is the whole issue, is the fact that if Italy does it, why shouldn't somebody else do it? And, you know, by European Union rules, actually, we should all be doing the same thing. So the European Union right now is just an up, as much up in arms about this 5G as the United States because if they can do it, why not, why not us? This seems to me, I, I want to get into some very specific difficult issues like Turkey and Nord Stream 2 and so on, but let me just on the broad theme ask you all again. The free rider problem is, cons I think, is considerable. It uh, was in evidence as we worked our way toward World War II in the last century. And we can put forth what people should do, but the incentives for them to do the right thing are kind of hard to see in some cases. One of the questions that comes to mind is, who brokers a new COCOM? Is that strictly the US responsibility? As countries say, well, if Italy can do what it wants, why not us? Is there any, is this the, just the human condition and the risks that we face, or is there something more that could be done to address that? Because maybe that's one of the central problems with facing NATO. I think this is a matter of <laughs> I think this is a matter of leadership. I think that uh, that that free peoples uh, who st who still retain some common sense. I think the cultural Marxists in our universities are trying to gut our cap capability of exercising common sense. But I think that uh, free peoples will respond with common sense if they're if they are told the truth by their national leaders. Uh, what bothers me is that we've had the, the previous five presidents never told uh, a whiff of truth about the rise of China. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's espionage presence, it's technology theft, it's, uh, and, and it's subversion operations in the United States. The degree to which they, they are owning uh, you know, politicians, they're owning businesses, they are owning, uh, they have corrupted our media, they have corrupted uh, uh, they're corrupting our academic uh, community. They are, they are influencing Hollywood. Uh, they, uh, this is, this to... is incredible. And nobody, nobody, there's no discussion about this. The, nobody tells the truth about this. Can I ask you a question related to this and also give you, uh, give uh, Tom and Anna Maria, if I may become familiar at this stage in the discussion, the chance to just think, I want to ask you both about Nord Stream 2 and how we deal with that, but while you're, but could I just, on yeah. Russia and China, um, to what extent is it dangerous to NATO, to all of us, that they cooperate with each other these days? Um, I think that it is, um, I think that there are limits actually to the Russia-China cooperation. They have done some cooperative military exercises, but I think that those are, were done to a large extent uh, to ensure that uh, there were no misunderstandings when some of those uh, exercises might have taken place close to the border of those two countries. Uh, I think that objectively, I think China is the single greatest threat to Russia. And, and if we ever, and if, and if, and if the Russians uh, ever overcame their congenital streak of perversity, uh, they would be cooperating with us against the Chinese. 
I can hardly wait for the day when uh, uh, a bunch of Chinese in Eastern Siberia decide that they want to have a referendum uh, on, on uh, which country they want to live in. Well, the Russians uh, have been worrying about that too. I yeah, well, <laughs> okay. I think they need to, to, to take a big bite out of a reality sandwich and stop being perverse about, about their relations with us and realize they cooperated with us a little bit on the Afghan war and they let us bring materiel through the northern route and so on and so forth. Let them, let them get serious about the real threat that they're facing and that we're facing. Nord Stream 2. What do we do about this? Uh, Nord Stream 2 is uh, difficult, really difficult. Two, two reasons. Um, it has really divided Europe because there are countries like Austria and you know, obviously Germany that are for it and uh, countries like the UK who are against it. Um, so that's one problem, it's divided Europe. Uh, but I think for a poll particularly or anybody from Eastern Europe, uh, to see um, any kind of joint venture between Germany and, and Russia is, is frightening, you know, because you look back to 1939. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, actually the, the, the problem here um, is the energy uh, security part of this thing. Um, this way, Ukraine really loses out because the pipe is not going to go through Ukraine and the, uh, Poland to a certain extent too. Um, and, and I think the whole idea of, um, of not having your scene too is, is the fact that we do not want to be dependent on Russia for energy. So um, if we, that's why LNG came up as a great source of energy, uh, the Baltic pipe, all these other things, as an alternative. I think with Nord Stream 2, the problem is that um, as we impose sanctions, nobody seems to pay any attention. Russia and Germany are going ahead with it, and France and Germany are also making some kind of a deal with territorial waters, and in the end, um, they're all happily chugging along, and before we know where we are, this thing is going to be completed, and we're going to be have missed the, missed the boat. I think, if anything, it's that we can show some sort of solidarity on this, uh, in, on this it, it may actually you know, produce some results. In the meantime, it's very, very dangerous. Tom, let me sharpen the question with no warning. Are Americans going to end up dying because of this? No, I mean, I think there's a little exaggeration in that question. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna go back to the Nord Stream 2 yeah. question. It's, it's a bad deal for the United States and I think it's a short-sighted deal for, for Europe because you're, um, uh, you're letting a uh, whole uh, uh, power lever uh, reside in the hands of the Russians and oh by the way no different than uh, the Iranian deal you're giving them the uh, financial wherewithal to continue to do mischief either uh, small mischief in a lot of places or big mischief at the at the tactical uh, at the strategic level so what do we do um, I, I think we work with our partners like Poland and others to flood the continent with American natural gas. Mm -hmm. And I think we give them some credit, uh, even if it's just psychological credit um, uh, and, and maybe formal credit, which I'm sure the Germans won't really like too much, uh, for the security premium that they pay to not buy uh, gas from the United States, mm -hmm. that they're gonna pay more they're going to pay more for, for it's just a, a physical fact of the world that it's, it's more expensive to bring LNG in uh, from, from out of area than to run a pipeline from, from Russia. Sure. But I think if we work in concert, we give them some credit for the fact. I actually believe that most of the, uh, of the countries of Europe like to hold on to their own sovereignty and don't want to be dependent. Um, and... Uh, so I, I think the, the best way for us to operate here is maybe to take a look at how we can support the infrastructure development, especially uh, north-south with the branches from the Polish coast down uh, for U.S. energy resources and to recognize that our partners are going to pay a premium, so work with them the best we can on that, and then to give them credit for the fact that they're actually paying a premium for their own sovereignty and security. 
And uh, I, you know, for us to get into some sort of uh, crazy, you know, we're capitalists. It, for us to get into a, a crazy, uh, uh, over-the-top um, type of measures related to a business deal between Germans and Russians, well, I mean, I'm not going to knock. I served in Germany for three years, and I have a lot of friends who are German. But let's remember who was trading with each other right until right up until the Germans invaded Russia. Mm. Okay, so that this is what they do. They they're going to trade, and we should we should use our trade in a way to uh, to maximize our our own interests and the interests of our partners. Well, what do we do about uh, this? Is for anyone who wants to take it on. Um, unless nobody does, and then I'll... <laughs> uh, Ukraine. Are we doing enough? Russia still has Crimea. Officially, it's not supposed to. There are sanctions, but de facto, there it is. Um, that would presumably send quite a message to Vladimir Putin. Uh, where does Ukraine fit into this scheme? Is there something we should be doing that we're not? Um, would anyone care to comment on what we do about that? Well. Um, one thing that I think needs remediation, I mean, uh, there, I, I don't know enough about the realities on the ground uh, or this, uh, some of the, uh, enough about the internal politics of Ukraine to give you a serious uh, answer about how much influence we can or ought to have there. But <clears throat> we have shut down um, for example, the Russian service of the Voice of America, the Ukrainian service. Uh, we're shutting down other services. The last administration tried to shut down the Chinese service of the Voice of America. And these are some of the only unfiltered, this is some of the only unfiltered information that reaches the ears of many of these people. When Putin started uh, shutting down independent media, uh, he, he almost had a, a, a monopoly in shaping the, 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 the minds of people both in Russia and in the Russian-speaking areas of Ukraine as part of the prelude to, to, the, to the invasion. And, and I think that restoring uh, uh, unfiltered information, and, it, and this usually has to be, there are many ways of doing it, multimedia, but I think short wave is one of the few ways that can get in there. Uh, you can't rely on the internet when, when internet police and, and other kinds of things like that can be shut and can, can be used to shut down. So going back yeah. to older technologies might actually yes. make sense. But there, but there are newer technologies like the digital revolution in, 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 in radio broadcasting, uh, which it's called DRM. It is called Digital Radio Mondial, and, uh, and this is where, where one can broadcast over shortwave frequencies, not only sound, but text and video, and the people uh, listening or watching or reading the, these broadcasts uh, can do so anonymously. Uh, whereas, you know, in, in, for example, in China, you know, people, uh, there are more internet police in China than there are members of the People's Liberation Army. Uh, and, and so anonymity is absolutely key to being able to get information without being potentially victimized by a, a, an authoritarian or totalitarian regime. I think that's one thing that can be done that can be helpful. Um, Anna Maria, you've had a front row seat. Uh, so. Uh, a question about the reign of Vladimir Putin. Is this, is this going to be re resolved? Sorry, I'm listening to the sirens in the distance, uh -huh. the warnings. Of the, is this going to be resolved while he remains in power? Would removing him make a difference? Is this there's something astonishing? Perhaps it shouldn't be surprising and yet quite dramatic about the rise, the sort of resurgence of this Russian threat. Uh -huh a generation after everybody was celebrating that it was apparently gone, uh, after the partnership for peace, after all these things. Um, what would it actually take to bring the kind of security that certainly Poland must, has been craving for 
generations for... But you have to be careful what you wish for. I mean, this yeah. is precisely what the Arab Spring was about. Yeah. This is what we wanted, you know, well, let's get rid of Gaddafi, let's get rid of Saddam Hussein. And it doesn't work that way because you never know who you're going to get next uh -huh. and what is going to happen next. I worked for five years for a Middle Eastern company way back after when I was really young. And I remember my boss saying at the time, he says, you know, and he was from Saudi Arabia. He said, you know, these countries are not ready for a democracy because they don't, they don't really, there's too many different sects and so on. I'm not saying that the same thing applies to, to Russia, uh, but there will be somebody else around the corner who, you know, who will be equally bad or worse. Uh, we, we simply don't know. Um, I think the only way to go for it is, is really to, um, as, a, as a deterrent, I mean, you know, what are you going to do, have a coup against him? Uh, maybe somebody will get rid of him, you know, but then what? Then somebody else. I don't know. I don't think there's an easy solution. Thank you. Is it, I think it's time to open up the floor to audience questions. Wow. Um, oh boy. And I see we have a few. <laughs> Why don't we start with the gentleman here? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, they'll bring a microphone around to you. Can you yeah, identify you. yourself, sir? Yeah. Pardon me? Can you, can you say who you are? Oh, my name is Dr. Richard Boutwell. I'm a historian. I started a historical group in Norfolk, Virginia, and I'm a member of a board of governors of two different locations in, in, in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Thank I'm you. from Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you. I, okay, we've got... That's <laughs> enough of me, right? That's great. <laughs> Go ahead. I, uh, your, your, your discussions are fabulous. Um, I've got a, let me say what I heard so far that NATO is a military alliance in order to protect the common principles of inclusion. That's one of the things I heard from you that might be right. Close right. enough. And, and then the rest of the discussion has been a series of incidences about what the common could threat... I, could I ask you to sharpen that into a question so we can get... Okay, to the, the common answer. threat is America has a history of isolation. We've re reluctantly gone into all kinds of conflicts. It seems to me, Dr. Zawinski, that your comments about controlling public information is the key. Is it some way that we can mobilize Americans to understand the threat that you're talking about so that we will be on the offensive rather than on the defensive? Because we're reacting in, in a mode and we're not acting itself. Thank you very much. So Sir, maybe uh, I would like to answer that one because yeah. I was actually at, um, at the CEPA meeting <laughs> we had. I saw Reza here somewhere. Uh, and uh, Marcy Capter was talking about this. This question came up, and they said, how do you mobilize people? And she said precisely that. She says, you know, around the United States, there are so many different ethnicities. You've got to tell people what this is about. I personally think that there is an abys abysmal lack of knowledge anyway about history. My son was at Tufts University, so read history. There was nothing about World War II. I spent a lot of time promoting Poland, uh, the part of Poland, the deportations from Poland to Siberia. Well, people ask me why there are so many Polish people all over the world, because they don't really know. I think you can make people understand, you can make them support you, if you'd really show them what it's all about. A young person who has never experienced communism, I'm horrified at some of the comments here from newly elected officials. I mean, uh, clueless about socialism, you know? I mean, it's pathetic. I think you really do have to start with education. Thank you. Uh, you. Yes, I, I think that um, the President of the United States needs to deliver a speech that is, that is not unlike Ronald Reagan's televised speech to the nation in November 1982 on the Soviet threat. Uh, one of the reasons why he was elected was because of the march of, of communism around the world, one communist takeover, whether it was Ethiopia, Somalia, Mozambique, uh, Angola, Grenada, uh, Nicaragua, invasion of Afghanistan, etc. cetera. And, and, and the humiliation uh, rendered us because of the, the, the takeover of our embassy in Iran and, 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 the, uh, uh, and, and the Soviet military buildup. And, and, and the, the, even with all of that, the president still needed to persuade the Congress uh, that we needed to have a serious military buildup. And so he had charts, 
He showed them with the bar graphs uh, to, to the nation, and it was a, a very sobering uh, exercise of, of leadership. Uh, I think that Vice President Pence did something like that at the Hudson Institute last October in, in what was described uh, as a, an equivalent of, of, of Churchill's uh, Westminster uh, College, Ful you know, Fulton, Missouri, Iron Curtain speech, uh, although it didn't get the kind of national attention that a televised nationwide speech would give. But I think that kind of, of public information is absolutely necessary. And, 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 and to tell people about what the nature of these regimes are. I mean, serious, serious sinologists today are calling China the Third Reich with Chinese characteristics, okay? With the, the, the persecution of, of religious minorities, a million Uyghur Muslims thrown into the re so-called re-education camps, brainwashing camps in Xinjiang province, uh, the persecution of Christians, the persecution of Falun Gong, and the persecution of ordinary Chinese who, dis who dissent. You know, you're never going to have. So we should yeah, be hearing we, more. We've got to hear the story. truth. The truth has to Thank be you. told, and our national <laughs> leaders have to do it. And the Europeans could help. The Europeans could tell some truth too, and rather not just look at their navels, but pay attention to the entire world. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take. Are there any questions over here? I can't see you, so let me. Okay, uh, then how about right here? Thank you. <coughs> this gentleman, and if you could just briefly let us know who you are. I'm Humphrey, intel analyst, a former diplomat. Um, any analyst who looks at Crimea realizes that if you had a real free election, except for the Tartars, they really would vote to join Russia. So I, you gotta pick your battles. And let me propose two battles to pick. Let's could see I, what you could think. I ask, I'm gonna ask everyone, forgive me, for, to just frame this as Shouldn't a Shouldn't we have a dozen uh, NATO ships conducting freedom of navigation operations in the Sea of Azov uh, to prevent uh, the Russian takeover of that? And shouldn't NATO have some sort of policing function to, uh, to cover the wayward uh, members like Italy signing on to Belt and Road and particularly Turkey supporting Maduro, which is nuts. General, I think this is a question for you. Well, uh, from a... Uh, I I'm, I'm, again, I'm not a, uh, uh, I think the, the whole Belt and Road question and policing NATO members, that's, in my view, that's the wrong way to, to do it. I think leading, convincing, show, showing the problem. I do believe that exercising NATO forces for uh, freedom of movement in the global commons uh, is absolutely critical. And uh, even though I'm, I'm an army guy, I, uh, uh, I believe that the, uh, our investment in our Navy, which is our forward uh, arm uh, of, um, of public diplomacy and uh, letting people know that they can be assured that the United States are, is actually with them uh, is, has been woefully underfunded until the last two years. And I hope we continue to, to build that up so that we can exercise freedom of movement in the commons. Thank you. Anything over this, about way in the back, the gentleman there. Hi, my name is Tom Cavalier from American University. I was wondering, as you mentioned, that uh, we we're saying we're not speaking the truth. When did we stop speaking the truth? Anyone? I, I think we stopped speaking the truth with when the, uh, when, when the Soviet system collapsed. Uh, we, we said, ding dong, the wicked witch is dead, and we went on a 10-year long national siesta concerning matters of war and peace. And we, we enjoyed the peace dividend, and everybody in Europe has been having a good time for a, for a very long time. And uh, the, apparently there's no need for defense and there's no such thing as enemies. And, uh, you know, uh, secure lines of sea lines of communication somehow in here in nature. And, uh, you know, this is all just a great big reverie. And, uh, you know, we had to have the, the Twin Towers come down before we got, uh, you know, a little dose of reality. 
uh, but we haven't been telling the truth for a long time about these yeah. things. Can I just chime in too? Somewhere along the line, um, we decided that you can't speak to somebody and take deterrent actions against them at the same time. I mean, President Kennedy talked with Khrushchev, Khrushchev at the same time that he was rushing forward uh, the uh, uh, resources into American technology to close the missile gap and to, and to build up our ability to deter the Soviet Union. We, we the quote unquote that, that every politician likes to use, we, we can chew gum uh, and, and walk at the same time. I like to think that, that we can do that and that's, I think you can talk the truth and still have dialogue and recognize that you got, you got a threat we're going to deal with the threat over here. When you want to talk to us, we're ready to engage with you. That doesn't mean that you have to appease them and send billions of dollars to an enemy or, or uh, 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 cancel the deployment of, uh, of um, anti-missile uh, systems uh, to Europe because you're afraid of upsetting somebody or, in fact, standing by and turning a blind eye to aggression because I think we can work with this guy. And, and unfortunately, every single president for the last 30 years, really, has, uh, has done that to a degree, and I think it's time for that to come to an end. I think also, I think we've gone crazy about political correctness, generally. Everything, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so, precisely what the general there. said, afraid it's upset somebody. This is, the, this is a huge problem. And I'm not talking militarily now, but I think definitely it goes uh, broad stream everywhere, you know? It's just people are afraid to speak their minds because they're always going to upset somebody. Uh, any I, quick suggestion yeah. on how we deal with that? I, <laughs> I don't know. I think President Trump is probably the, uh, is not particularly politically correct. It doesn't always get him where he wants to, but he probably isn't. He says what he thinks at that particular moment. <laughs> Claudia, I just wanted to mention that uh, we need greater professionalism in understanding how other countries conduct political warfare uh, and, and psychological operations against us. Mm -hmm. And very, nobody studies this stuff unless they come to the Institute of World Politics, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only place you can study this stuff. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the Chinese, for example, have been engaged in what I call psychological anesthetization, which is akin to intellectual disarmament, which then is, produces physical disarmament. And, and unless you know how other countries do this kind of stuff to us, you're, 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 there's, there aren't going to be any voices on the staffs of presidents and secretaries of state, senators and so on and so forth, who can say, no, look, this, they're doing this to us. We can, you know, we need to overcome that. And perhaps we need to develop some capacities to conduct political, ideological, and psychological warfare against some of these people. They conduct Cold War operations against us. Why can't we reciprocate? What's wrong with strategic reciprocity? What's wrong with it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. I, um, yes, ma'am. <coughs> My name's Li Yang. Uh, for first introduction, I'm a PhD in economics. Uh, I've been in the United States in the mid-60s. And uh, I've been uh, really a reformer, advocate, uh, activist. I have a media television program producers, and uh, I have run for public office since 94, from local Rockwell city mayors to Maryland state controller, and uh, several times on U.S. Congress and uh, U.S. Uh, Thank uh, you. Senate. If you can so go ahead. What I try to say is I have a as very expensive uh, uh, observations. And to begin with, I'm confused with your banner, the title, because I, I have no idea 
They uh, indicate this is a White House Historic Society for General Public. In on the behind, and you will see there are three minor institutions. One is a Polish National. Excuse me, if you can give us a short question. Right. The short question is how are we going to have a people to tell the truth through the education? The problem is that our education is a failure. They don't develop people's integrity or accountability from institution or institute of war affair and National Academy of Science. They are all failing and, and they don't speak the truth. All they want is a diverse the general public or individuals or private sectors or from federal government. Try, try to say, say we must speak the truth with a good education, not with a uh, propaganda. Thank you. If I may, I think we've just been addressing this. Um, if anyone would like to add yes, something. I'm just to going to say in that case, let's see the victims of communism here behind me, okay? Uh, great institution. They are informing people about communism. There is a plan to build a museum here in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, informing the world about communism. This is the only way. You need monuments, you need museums, you need professors, you need people to talk about it. That's the only way that you can do it. Um, you know, and of course, there is the negative propaganda about everything. But as I said before, you're absolutely right. You have to speak the truth, but you need the people to speak the truth. You need to get the interest of the people to speak up, not only about Russia. We have other countries in the world, you know, we have Cuba. We have other countries in the world where there's still communist rule. So you just have to speak up. Thank you. Um, the gentleman in the back row there. Thank you. I'm Major uh, Mike Dyer, U.S. Army. I'm a grad student here in town at George uh, Washington. So uh, for the panel, uh, I'd like to cut right back to brass tacks on uh, NATO. So as we've uh, heard today, uh, and I agree with this uh, narrative, the dynamic of NATO uh, in the past 25 years got away from the uh, core foundation of uh, sovereignty defense of continental Europe. So if we have returned back to that and we have circled back around to that core principle, what do the recent additions of uh, Montenegro and North Macedonia, uh, how do they fall into that narrative? Are they part of the old narrative? Uh, and what does that tell us about the future of NATO expansion or the possibility of NATO expansion? Primarily, I'd like to focus that question on Ukraine. Thank you. Who would like to take that softball? I think that, um, the, uh, that NATO expansion, first of all, <clears throat> I'd like to look at, at some of its record. There are a lot of people who think that NATO expansion has been uh, a provocative move against the Russians, and that the Russians are therefore justified in taking various actions against the West because we have come so close to their borders in the expansion of NATO. Uh, to this, I would just like to say that NATO has never been an aggressive alliance. I think NATO made one mistake and handed Russia some evidence for its, its, uh, its charge, and that's when we got involved in, in, in Bosnia and Kosovo. Uh, and um, that, is, that, is a, and the, you know, that is a matter of prudential judgment. The reason we got involved in there was to prevent those conflicts from metastasizing into a much larger regional war that could have gone as far as involving Turkey. And so I think that there, were, there was a preventive war element to, to that intervention. But I will, I will concede that the Russians have a point when they look because NATO got involved without being attacked, okay? So there is a point to that. But we gave NATO, we gave Russia a, uh, a, an open door to joining NATO themselves. And we, we set up the entire Partnership for Peace arrangement, which was first, you know, where first the East Central European countries joined and we gave Russia the capacity, you know, the, the capability of being part of this, where they had observers in NATO and at the North Atlantic Council. And, uh, and, and 
and, and, if, and, and I believe that if they had wanted to, they could have joined in on this alliance in the interest of defending our larger, so to speak, Western civilization insofar as Russia still considers itself at all part of the West uh, against radical Islamism and China. Uh, but r the Russians decided not to do this. And, and so, you know, each of these are, each of the members of NATO are sovereign countries and they ought to be able to be able to make their own decision as to wh whether, you know, wh if they want to join such an alliance and undertake the obligations of doing so. I think that this, this that, that, that NATO has been an incredibly good investment for the West. Remember how many minority groups of each of the different countries of, in East Central Europe live outside the borders of those countries. Hungarians living in Romania, for example, and et cetera, et cetera. The, the, there are irredentist claims that each one of these nations could make against their neighbors. There, could, you know, there are Poles living in Lithuania. There are Poles living in Ukraine. Uh, you know, there have been wars, you know, there have been skirmishes in the past over places like Cheshen, Teshen. Uh, you know, why on, you know, uh, we put a stop to all of that with the expansion of NATO. And basically the message was, you join, you become a good citizen. Forget about your irredentist claims. Forget about all of your old territorial claims. And, 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 and be a good citizen, mind your own business, build a shining city on the hill, and you can be part of our deal. And those countries behaved that way, have been good citizens, and there has been peace in Europe as a result of that, and there has been good commerce, and there's been economic development, and I think it's been a great investment. And if the Russians don't want to be part of this, that's their problem. I think that's a... Brilliant note on which to end this discussion. I'm sorry, we've reached the end of our time and have to wrap up. But thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for a wonderful audience and wonderful panel. Thank you.